Welcome to This Team is Killing Us, a podcast about what the Carolina Panthers do to good people. She is Lauren Brownlow. I am Demetri Ravanis. And Lauren, uh, what is killing me today is the takes. Now, I know it is tough to be a Carolina Panthers fan. Nothing about this makes sense to anybody. But even the smart people that cover this team were absolutely broken by what happened Sunday. And I have seen some of the wildest suggestions how to make things right going forward. Yes, I, I would agree with that. It it breaks everyone's brain. Um, and for me, you know I wasn't all that surprised, in part because it almost felt like the, the game itself was like this weird microcosm of the trade with Chicago in and of sure. itself. Like a series of unfortunate events that continued to pile on top of one another. Some of the Panthers' own making, some somewhat like unfortunate yeah. events that happened. Like the fact that you fire Matt Rule and get an interim in there, you know, and you end up sliding to nine in the draft is the whole reason you have to trade up in the first place. You know, it's like a whole snowball effect of, of things that went into it. And then all of a sudden you're like, I got to have this quarterback. I got to have a quarterback. Oh, my God. Oh, my right. God. Oh, my God. And then you're like, sure, you'll take it. They have another pick this year. We're not the, even done. Yeah. If the Panthers finish again with the number one pick of the draft, the 33rd pick then becomes the Bears. I mean, it's going to be it's a second round pick. No matter where in that 33 through 64 range, that is prime real estate that you are still on the hook for. So you could look at how shitty the Bears have played all year for the most part and, and all that. I mean, one of the guys they drafted with one of the picks is the punter who has his own highlight reel now. I was I would, expecting him to score for real. Yeah, I, I would tell you that Caleb Williams, who obviously Caleb and DJ are forever going to be the uh, faces of that trade, I think. Uh, at least on the Bears side. Obviously, Bryce is the big face of the trade. Um, Caleb Williams largely had been not shitty, but certainly like unimpressive up until that game. And I had no doubt after kickoff that he was going to have the best game of his NFL career. And of course he did. Zero doubt. I mean, in part because of nothing else except this defense. Yeah. Like it sucks. We understand that it sucks. So that gets me to the first wild take. And this was out there on Twitter. I know our old employer was pushing this uh, idea yesterday on the radio. Uh, that Robert Salah, who got fired by the New York Jets as their head coach before he was the Jets coach, he was a well-renowned defensive coordinator uh, for the San Francisco 49ers. The running with all of this was that Robert Salah, because he has a two-decade-long relationship with Dave Canales, obviously that's the change you make, bring him in to be the Panthers' new defensive coordinator. I have one simple response to this. Please. I'm sorry. Does he have a magical wand that he can wave that brings in better personnel? Because if not, it does not fucking matter. Lord, I want to. I want to give you a stat from Sunday that hits on exactly what you are talking about. The problem is not the scheme. The problem is not uh, the formations. The problem is just a lack of talent at the most basic elements of playing defense, Lauren. Uh, We're going to do the old joke where I say the Panthers pass rush is so bad. And you say. Oh, that I want to die inside. Well, no, usually you say, usually you say, how bad is it? But I I don't know. How bad is it? Sorry. How bad (laughs) is it is that uh, they brought pressure on Caleb Williams 33% of the time in this game. When he faced pressure, Lauren Brownlow. Yes. Caleb Williams was 8 for 10 passing with 128 yards and a touchdown. (laughs) See, this is how bad I already know things are. I'm actually just impressed they got that much pressure in the first place. Do you know how many quarterback hits the official scores credited the Panthers with? Now, remember, for people... I don't remember many. Yeah, so quarterback hits includes both sacks and making contact with the yes. quarterback after the throw in a way that is not a penalty. That is I think I can think of hit. one off the top of my head. Okay, good. There was one other in the whole game. By contrast, the Bears hit Bryce and Andy Dalton a combined 11 times. Andy Andy took a beating. Andy yeah. took a real beating. And, and you know what? Bryce looked pretty good moving around in and out of pressure. I guess looked better than he has. 
but he took a couple of shots too yep. after some throws. I mean, there was like the the offensive line injuries, which we'll get to more in depth a little bit later on. It's bad. I mean, it, just, bad. it felt hopeless because I am used to this defense looking like just hot garbage. The offensive line had been the one thing that looked competent, and boy, did they not look competent on uh, on Sunday. Speaking of Bryce, um, another like, come on, guys, what are we even doing here? Take came from Joe Person, who is around this team every single day for the Athletic, and is normally really good, actually. And it is, I think, is really good at yeah, yeah, what yeah. he does. He wrote a column. And I don't have the exact title here in front of me, but it's basically the idea was, hey, the team is bad. Just put Bryce back in there. Let him be the starting quarterback again. Like, yeah, I saw this and I'm I'm like, OK, wait, have we learned nothing? Yeah. Also, let me let me put on the hat to make this point, because it's very important. You all know where I still stand on this. The offense looks so much better with Dalton. You can't go back to Bryce. I get no. that it is a lost season already, just four games in, five games in. But you cannot go back to Bryce after what we've seen out of Andy Dalton. Right. I mean, it's 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 a it's a situation where both won. Like we saw, like you said, how much better the offense looked. But the other part of it, even just from a Bryce point of view, is like. Who does that serve exactly? So I'm it glad sure as fuck doesn't serve Bryce. I'm glad you bring that up, Lauren. I want to play for you uh, a clip from Dave Canales right after the game on Sunday that sort of leaves you throwing your hands up on in the air on like if they're not going to trade this dude, what is the plan? Yeah, I just uh, just saw it as an opportunity there. You know, we had a couple of injuries on the offensive line, um, and again, just like wanted to get him in there to just make, you know, get some live reps. Um, and he did a fantastic job, you know, playing with energy, extending plays, finding some completions down the field, which was all fantastic. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a hard situation, you know, but at, the, at that point it was just like, okay, with just the different things happening on the offensive line, you know, it was something that where I wanted to get Andy out of there. To me, what I come away with is, we had to get the guy that we are trusting as the quarterback out of there. Let's throw Bryce in. And if that's the case, like, just think about it from a business point of view. What are you doing to your investment? Just trade the guy then. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some truth there. Although I guess, like, I did see somebody say, like, oh, well, it'd be a really a buy low. And I'm like, yeah, but how would you get it to be buy higher? Yeah, like, what what on earth could you do that serves the Panthers on the field and also in the value of uh, Bryce Young. You know what won't get it to be by higher? <laughs> Putting him in behind the offensive line as currently constructed because the injuries are brutal and it's making, we saw it make a big difference as that game played out and it's going to continue to make a worse difference as it goes on. Like it's going to get worse before it gets back. We saw that as the game went on and we're going to keep seeing it. Maybe they have natural grass there at Soldier Field, right? Yeah, they do. So maybe it wasn't a, a natural grass issue with all the injuries because I'm sitting there like, because again, the calamity of awful that has to happen <laughs> through a fault of both the Panthers. And again, yeah. like circumstance, right, is also the, all the injuries happening during that game. I'm like, yeah, this this went about as poorly as you could think, just like the trade did, you know? Yeah. So it was just like, because like as, as they keep dropping, I'm like, oh, this is so bad. Like now yeah. any positive that you have to take from this season, any forward momentum it's like, uh, unless some guys can get back pretty quickly, that's gone. Yeah, I actually, I thought Bryce looked like you would want him to coming back in that situation where it does look like he had some time to reset. He did not look like he panicked under pressure. But, you know, what realistically can you do for the guy's value short of him having a complete turnaround where you don't want to trade him? And that's not realistic at this point. All of these. It, it was different, too, because that's not a game pressure situation. Yeah. You know, and we we saw how he responded. I know it was a few weeks ago, at least, but I don't know any psychologist that works that fast. Right. <laughs> uh, that we saw how he looked at the beginning of games, especially where yeah. he just looked the, almost worse than he did as the games went on in the beginning, where it was like, OK, well, now it's zero zero. Now what you got? And it was not much ever. I want to I want to ask you this because coming off. Of, so these crazy hot takes coming off of. Every team apparently targeting the Panthers receiving core as the 
um, center no of the trade rumor universe. Are we at a point, you are much more long-term emotionally invested in this team than I am. Are we just at a point where we want something new to talk about with this team beyond just how bad things are on the field that even the most insane takes are not going to be dismissed by even the most sane voices? Yeah, I mean, maybe that's part of it. I don't know. Or maybe there's part of it of like, there is this weird, it's almost like. Like you want to feel something other than pure anger around this team by this point, right? I mean, it's, it, you know, a yes and no, right? Like for, for like two weeks, we had something, you know, right. for like two games, essentially. It was like the Raiders and the Bengals. There was at least something to build on in the Bengals game and something positive. Like we were to the point where it was like, yeah, they lost, but look, they, they played pretty well. Like, okay, mm -hmm. we can take that. That's fine. And now with the offense looking how it's looking, it's just like, okay, so this is just going to look exactly how it looked last right. year. And that's where it gets discouraging because like, Literally, uh, you know, a part of my soul will never uh, grow back. That was <laughs> us watching that. Um, and like, I don't I don't know how you get anyone excited about anything that's happened. And so I think part of it, too, though, is like this limbo with Bryce. I think that's I think that plays into some of the hot takes around him where it's like it's like, OK, so what are they going to do with him? Yeah. And, and it's unclear. I think it's probably unclear to Bryce as well. And I want. I wish there were more clarity, honestly. And I know every in the NFL, it's still very cavemanish, and we hate talking about things like mental health and whatever. But like, I'm sorry, as a fan, I want to know that he's been getting some sort of psychological care in terms of like how he's doing and how he's been processing things, because it was very obvious to me that that might be necessary. Well, I mean, even if you are the most like, you know, oh, psychotherapy is uh, is bullshit. Even if you are that kind of person. At the very least, you would want to check in on Bryce's mental health because it would be good for the team, whether you're keeping him or trading him, to make sure he is not so broken that he just does not belong in football anymore. It's not an empirical thing, obviously, but like the only person that's ever taken more sacks in a season than him was undoubtedly psychologically broken by it. And so like to me, I look at those things and I go, OK, well, what could we do differently with a guy like Bryce in this situation to at least make sure that doesn't happen and to potentially like you already have invested all of this stuff into him. Like yep. at least give him some of that care. And that's why I don't want to see him back either, because I don't think he's right. I don't think he's ready for that. Like, especially going in behind yet another shitty offensive line now that all these injuries have happened. Yeah. I mean, listen, the between David Carr is who Lauren was talking about, the person that took more sacks than uh, Bryce in his rookie year. Between all the sacks and just the immediately being saddled with the label of bust, you know, Ryan Leaf has talked about what that does to you on just a personal level, let alone let alone trying to get back to um, whatever the mental version is of game shape, right? Yes. Like there is a certain investment that the organization and the fans, not just people like me that came over for Bryce, but the fans in general having the guy that no matter what you think of psychology, you've got to know that the kid is going to be okay. Right? Like it's, it's in the best interest of the team, but Lauren, speaking of not okay, let's, uh, let's transition to talk about me now. Well, you as well, and I think Panthers fans in general, because if this offensive line is cooked, welcome back to 2023. Yeah, and that's what sucks. Yeah. You know? um, Just to to recap, um, Taylor Moten out this week for sure. Austin Corbett, who they kicked from guard inside to center. His season is over. That's the biggest one, right? Yeah. Uh, Corbett last year was part of – like he really was – all of the Panthers offensive line problems in a microcosm. And it's not because of how he played. It is because of how they played him. Like, yes. do you know that there were 13 different combinations of starting guards for the Panthers last year? And he yes. played on both sides of the line, both left and right guard, because we could not figure out what the right combination of offensive line was to keep I mean, this. I guess to their credit, at least they kept changing it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's true. Brady Christensen, who I guess emerged as the other like most consistent starter, uh, was downgraded to a backup this year when they invested all that money in uh, the guards. Well, hey, guess who's getting played time at center now? 
Brady Christensen. It w- I, I'd say that jokingly somewhat, yeah. and at least they keep changing it because, and, and you know this, I know, um, and I think probably most of our listeners do too, but um, offensive line is one of those position groups where cohesion is so important and, and having like a set of responsibilities that you know are yours each week and those not having to change a whole lot, that just – improves your line play so much. I mean, we saw it this year when the line did have cohesive play, Mm -hmm. you know, it was among, it was doing some of the best numbers in the league on a week, which was unimaginable. Literally Lauren, literally the week before last, it was the, the offensive line that allowed the least pressure on their quarterback that week. You know, in, in college football, we give out the Joe Moore award, which is an entire unit award for the offensive line, as opposed to just the single best player on the offensive line. Uh, The usual suspects, are in that conversation every year for a reason. And it felt like the Panthers were making progress yes. towards being uh, one of those usual suspects on the NFL level. Uh, but look, that group last year allowed Bryce, going back to what you were talking about, go, uh, allowed Bryce to be sacked 63 times. Um, what we saw on Sunday is enough to give you flashbacks because you know how bad it can get. Like you, you remember, it was not very long ago that we saw just how bad it can get. And I think more than anything, what worries me, whether it is for Bryce Dalton or who, I mean, like, God forbid they have to go to an emergency backup quarterback, is just the uncertainty. Yeah, I, that's a big part of it. But also, look, sorry to say this, it'll be worse than last year because last year, at least, I was arguing with somebody on Twitter about this. The defense was at least decent. Mm-hmm. It wasn't yeah, agreed. like, like, you know, and sometimes it was even good. Yeah. But, you know, it, did it, was it like amazing personnel wise? I never said that. And I wouldn't say that, but I think they had better, much better personnel. I, I would argue that any day of the week than they have. Yeah. I, I don't think anybody with a straight face could say you're wrong about well, that. Some people were saying like, well, you know, because the offense was so bad, like the defense was often playing against offenses that weren't, you know, going full throttle, which is fair. That's a fair point with the games were not as close. So offenses weren't, you know, doing as much and sitting on leads. And there's some fairness to that. But I think even in the beginning of games, when it was close, I remember being like the defense is keeping them in it until they just wore down. And that's so with the defense being this bad and the offense being this bad. Oh, boy. So uh, my friend Taylor Dahl, who hosts a podcast about the Bears, had me on her show to preview the game last week. And she was asking me about. You know, if if you were the Bears, what is your best route of attack against this defense? And I told her, like, literally do whatever any, you want. Any of because, them. Yeah, because, because last year, um, you at least knew who the guys you could count on were. Yes. This year, I actually think up until last week, we had this nice string of somebody different in the secondary stepping up in a big, big way. That's great. Like, I think that's encouraging. But at the NFL level, if you believe J.C. Horn is your best player, J.C. Horn should be showing you he's at least your best defender in the secondary week in and week out. And even that's not happening. Yeah, I mean, the best thing he's doing right now, to be honest, for uh, for me, is staying healthy. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that's a huge step in the right direction. But, I mean, I say that and watch him get hurt, like, next week. And then all of a sudden, (laughs) it's even worse. And so, like, that's what I'm saying, too. It's just, like... The, it's not only the personnel was already bad. It's like they don't have any depth. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, on the defensive side, especially on the offensive line, they had a little more. But now with like three or four of them going down. Well, like, that's the thing, right? Like yeah. you invest a lot of money in overhauling the offense in the offseason. And one of the things that I think had flown under the radar just because we had been so disappointed. Uh, in those first two games is they actually invested in some offensive line depth. But now you're to the point where, okay, all that depth is playing, at least this week, if not for the next few weeks in front of you. Do we feel like we have depth anywhere on this team? Wide receiver? A little bit. Although the, some of the dudes they were playing, I'm like, excuse me, who? <laughs> and why? Yeah. Because there are other receivers that, like, I know they exist on the roster. So, uh, Are you specifically talking about uh, Jalen uh, Coker? No offense to him, but the only Coker football Coker I knew of before was Larry, and I didn't have the – Oh, the, sure fond memories of 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 his tenure you know? uh, i i don't know why any alabama fans that started with us last year are still watching uh or listening but if you are obviously you are shouting jacob coker at your uh oh at your uh listing device but no i mean i'm with you like i i think that if coker had been had a lot of those um 
respectfully calling them Jonathan Mingo moments where the ball is hitting you in the hands or numbers and dropping them. I would be more where you are with that. Like, I, I think he was a pleasant surprise discovery last week. I would like for them to limit him to being the fourth or fifth option as opposed to how often he got targeted this past week, though. Yeah, that's I think that was part of it for me, too. Is it's like, sorry, what <laughs> right. again and again? What? what? What's yeah. happening? But I mean, like, look, to his credit, he was targeted six times and caught five of them. Like, yeah, that, I know. I know. That, I know. that didn't just, happen with our rookie receiver last all year. All I'm saying is it was distressing because you hear yeah. undrafted free agent out of Holy Cross. And I'm like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, I, I told I told Lauren this in a text that like Coker is absolutely like David Tepper's wet dream in a nutshell. Small school guy made a huge impression during Senior Bowl week, and everybody was talking about this guy could be a steal in the later rounds of the draft for somebody. And lo and behold, all David Tepper has to do is write a check. He doesn't have to strategize to get it. Like, I guarantee you there is some ego stroking as to why he got signed by the Panthers. I'm glad he did. I'm with you. I don't want to see him getting that many targets again, though. Also, Jatavian Sanders, bro. Oh, Bro, and somebody said, is that the new, uh, the way that uh, the, the young kids today say uh, Ian Thomas? And I'm like, dang. <laughs> I'm like, I laughed at least, you know, you got a chuckle out of me. I forget. I, mean, I, that, I guess we will know for sure if we don't hear his name for the next four weeks and then suddenly he has a touchdown pass. This is only target in week nine or 10. Yeah, it's just, I mean, look, things are, it's, it's bleak, y'all. Like, yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to paint a rosy picture because there's not one to be painted right now. Well, let's uh, let's look on the bright side in the form of uh, shit talking other teams in just a second. Oh. But first, I do uh, have to tell you about OG fans. It is where all of the premium content at OG Triangle Media lives. It is where you can read what Lauren writes about the Carolina Panthers. Um, I really enjoyed the horror movie uh, comparisons you made in this past week's column. Thank you. I thought about doing this big thing about how the game was a microcosm of the trade. But as I wrote it, I was like, this sucks. Like, it, it, <laughs> let's be real about what this game was. This yeah. game was actually like worse than the trade. And it was it was horrific. I, I don't know if you saw the graphic I put together from your um, from your column for our subscribers on social media. But it was uh, DJ Moore going up for a touchdown pass, emerging from the blood coming out of the and that's uh, perfect because uh, every single one like shattered. and i knew i was like of course he scored yeah of course he scored twice i think i think steve smith when they played the ravens the one time they played them he scored at least once and i'm just sitting here like could just you know fuck me you know like <laughs> come on <laughs> Uh, OGTriangleMedia.com is where you go to sign up for OnlyFans. Not only is that where Lauren writes about the Panthers. It is where Joe Giglio writes about the ACC. It's where Lauren and Joe Ovius talk about the ACC because there are also exclusive podcasts you can get on OG fans like uh, ACC Panic Room. Uh, Ovius and I recorded a new episode of OG on business uh, for this week. There's all kinds of cool stuff. Sign up today, OGTriangleMedia.com. Lauren Brownlow, do you take any solace this week in not being the Cleveland Browns? I mean, most weeks, to be honest. <laughs> um, I mean, we heard we heard a lot about the trade this week during the game, and there's a lot that I will grant you, right? There, there's a lot that I will grant you. Bryce Young does unfortunately look like a bust. DJ Moore would absolutely solve a lot of those problems. Caleb Williams had his best game by far, but at the end of the day, Lauren Brownlow, the investment in Bryce Young is not the investment the Cleveland Browns made in Deshaun Watson. And if I'm, please correct me if my history is 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 wrong here, but they also made that deal literally after we had all the knowledge of yes. the lawsuits, yes, against him and what he. So, like, they chose Lauren, the deal. Which, by the way, uh, leaves $172 million of dead cat money if they were to say, hey, this Deshaun Watson thing isn't working and they cut him at the end of the season. $172 million cap hit for a player that wouldn't be on the roster. The reason he got that contract, the reason the contract was structured the way it was, Lauren, was because we knew all of the accusations and we knew what was coming as a result of the accusations. Yes. And, and they still were like, no, we, we'll, we'll, we'll take this. And also like, I feel like by the time 
and maybe maybe I am doing a little revisionist history here, but by yeah. the time the trade was made, also like he had started, he had a great start to his NFL career. There's no question, Deshaun. Um, but he, I, from what I remember, he had also kind of started to slide off a little bit. He had uh, been he had been injured, um, and then they basically just sat him down for a year as he was going through all of this, and they wanted to trade him. They, I'm talking they the the Texans. There were there were point. some there were like you know, there were definitely still some question marks there uh, in yeah. terms of his on-field play. So it was literally like, like that was one of those deals that when it happened, I, I said to myself, and I remember this, I was like, is he trying to win a contest of like which NFL owner hates yeah. women the most? Did, uh, did you hear Bomani Jones podcast on Monday? He talked about that there is a yeah. part of him every time Deshaun Watson has one of these kinds of games that like your natural instinct is to say, well, gosh, he did miss two whole years. There's a lot of rust that has to be shaken off. And then like at this point, you just have to remind yourself like you got to fight against that and go, no, maybe he's just bad. Like maybe this was just maybe, the worst deal. Maybe in the it's a rare instance of karma being real. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to give you. Lord, I'm sure everybody has seen this tweet by now because it has been everywhere this week. But you talk about karma being real. Uh, since signing that fully guaranteed deal with the Browns, by the way, they would still be paying him for two more years if they cut him at the end of this season. Since <laughs> signing that fully guaranteed deal with the Browns, Deshaun Watson has settled more civil lawsuits than he yeah. has thrown touchdown passes. My guy, James. 23 Dater. to 19. Yeah. <laughs> It was, a great, it was a great tweet. And and I mean, and it sucks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there are still people in spite of the amount of women, in spite of how, you know, how their stories have been pretty credible it, when they're held up to any kind of scrutiny, relatively consistent, even without having like spoken to it. You know what I mean? Like yeah. all of those things, it does not fucking matter. There are still people out there that are like, well, maybe. You know, or like, uh, do we know that this was uh, real? Lord, the, the absolute worst are the people that just openly don't care. Like, to, Actually, to be... you know, no, I prefer those people. Really? Legitimately, because they're honest about what they are. Uh, I guess I, I, I guess I understand that. I don't think of them as more honest than the people saying, well, we don't know as being dishonest. I, I think the people that are saying, well, gosh, we don't know. I just think they're fucking morons. Like, I, I don't think there's any other way to say it. Like, you're just a different brand of fucking moron than the guy who's proud of it. I, w I wish I could say that, but way too many of them over the years, if you probe a little bit beneath that right. belief, you get quickly to, but women lie a lot. So, you know, <laughs> they're actually like, they're, the, that's why I'm saying like the people that just say they don't care. I yeah. appreciate them. I appreciate the honesty more. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, the, the, you've heard that conversation around racism as well. Like the people that at least like have the Confederate flag out. Some people are like, well, at least I know where they stand. Right. You know, like, as opposed to the people who try to cloak it in something else and, and, you know. If, if we're going to do the bad owner contest. Mm. Obviously, Dave Tepper is, oh, buddy, he is really contending for the number one spot. However, Jimmy Haslam has been a disaster since yes. he bought the Browns. The Johnson family, as we were reminded this week with the firing Robert Salah, not that Robert Salah didn't deserve to be fired. Robert Salah is a bad head coach. I, I'm, I'm not dancing around that at all. But, like, you didn't know this is what you were going to get with Aaron Rodgers? Like, come on, man. Like. Yeah. That's also a pretty tear. And like, it's all happening this week that there is some weird relief for Panthers fans of maybe someone else is in this conversation. Um, yeah, you know, it's again, a relief I, for a moment. It's, it's right. Kind of I, like, I, I go back, I go back to Bomani. He had a great tweet this week uh, that said that, uh, yeah, Woody Johnson has the longevity, but maybe Dave Tepper is like the Patrick Mahomes of owners where you've seen enough to just know that this is an all-timer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some truth to that, but like, that's the thing is like, I saw people bring up the Matt Rule firing because that was the last time a coach had only had been fired after only like five games. Yeah. I don't know enough about the Jets situation to know if coming into this year, there was already momentum towards firing him like there was for Matt Rule because that was always my biggest beef with it. it was always I, like, was you know you're going to have to fire him. Right. There was definitely questions at the end of last season of whether or not Salah was going to come back. I guess with Rogers injury, that was just some enough to 
pulled it over, which makes I some guess, sense. Man. I, I mean, I, you know, so obviously being within our fan base, I am jaded a bit, but also Jets fans are so loud about how close they think they are every year. Like I look at the Jets situation. It's like, great. You fired your coach. Now just get rid of the owner, the quarterback and the entire fan base and you'll be on your way. Well, and in the Panther situation, like, yes, a bad owner is involved and he has a lot of say. How much say we don't we can't really fully know. At least he has better decision makers that he at least hired to do the job. Yeah, Hopefully he lets them whatever. Right. <laughs> They've made some decisions that are a lot better in this offseason that we've seen. And we saw them pay off, at, however, briefly. But in New York, who's in charge is not the owner, but instead the ayahuasca conspiracy theorist. uh <laughs> It turned into everything he used to hate Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> right. Uh, which like, sorry, I don't even know that I'd let him watch like my kid for five minutes, much I've, less a football team. <laughs> I've shared with you my belief about Aaron Rodgers and his convictions before, right? Like I believe that Aaron Rodgers is the kind of guy, imagine Aaron Rodgers were a woman, right? We would all say that Aaron Rodgers is changing herself to fit in with her boyfriend's new scene, right? She's the she's the kind of gal that wears cowboy boots when she dates a country boy and then immediately goes out and buys a leather jacket when her boyfriend buys a motorcycle. Aaron Rodgers has that relationship to literally any cool person he sees on the internet. Yeah, I could I could see that some. For me, it's like it's crazy because he used to be one of my favorite players in the NFL for a while. Um, and I remember Brett Favre always got on my nerves, to yeah. be honest, even before, you know, all the bad shit he did. <laughs> uh, and like, I always felt badly for Aaron Rodgers because like, he didn't ask to be drafted. Favre wasn't, you know, going to be a mentor to him. And now yeah. Aaron Rodgers has literally come to embody, except for maybe the welfare scam that we know of, um, everything that he hated about Brett Favre. And I remember like he did not like Brett Favre and you could tell, and I respected that about him because like so often the guys will just take the shit right. when they're, you know, in that situation, but you could tell it annoyed him and he didn't like it and I get it. But now he's, he's gotten so old that he's lived long enough to see himself become the villain, you know? And it's wild to me because I used to like him because he was like irreverent and funny and different. And to me, smart, at the time, you know, yeah. like, and now I don't even recognize like what he's become. And I can't imagine, like, would I, would I rather have him in charge of like making important hiring, firing decisions on my team or David Tepper? I, I don't know. Like I Look, have to think about it, which is a wild thing to say. Here's here. I, I can't believe I'm going to defend David Tepper here, Lauren, but I am. There is only one of those situations that gets you to head coach Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And it's not David Tepper as the owner. <laughs> Great point. Okay, listen. 